your service and your ongoing dedication to protecting and improving the lives of those around us. Thank you all very much. The U.S. Senate is about to meet on this Tuesday morning. Senators are likely to spend the morning on general speeches while negotiations continue over possible changes to Senate roles with a focus on how to possibly change the filibuster. And now to live coverage of the U.S. Senate here on C-SPAN 2. The Senate will come to order. The Chaplain, Dr. Barry Black, will lead us in prayer. Let us pray. O thou beginner of our yesterdays, mystery of our today, and hope of our tomorrows, we sometimes take your mercies for granted. Forgive us when we forget to be thankful for your presence in our nation and world. Thank you for the inauguration of our president and for this new chapter in our nation's history. Bless President Barack Obama. May the last words of King David of Israel characterize the leadership and legacy of his presidency. Those who rule over people must be just, ruling with godly reverence, and they shall be as the light of the morning without clouds, as the tender grass springing out of the earth by clear shining after rain. We pray in your sovereign name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge your allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Mr. President. The Senate Majority Leader. Following leader remarks, if any, the Senate will be in a period of morning business until 12.30 today. Senators during that period of time will be permitted to speak for up to 10 minutes each. We'll be in recess from 12.30 until 2.15 to allow for our weekly caucus meetings. Mr. President, today, with the inspiration of the second inauguration of President Obama, fresh in our minds, we renew our effort to fill the promise of prosperity for every American. The theme of yesterday's inauguration was faith in America's future. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose birth and life we also celebrated yesterday, once said, quote, faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase, close quote. I have faith that the members of the 113th Congress will bring this nation closer to realizing the promise of prosperity. The last Congress was too often characterized by sharp political divides, divides that hampered efforts to foster success for all Americans. I'm hopeful and cautiously optimistic that the 113th Congress will be characterized not by our divisions, but by our renewed commitment to cooperation and compromise. I urge every woman and every man forced enough to serve in this chamber to remember it is possible to hold fast to your principles while making the compromises necessary to move our country forward. Democrats will hold fast to the guiding principle that a strong middle class and an opportunity for every American to enter the middle class is the key to this nation's success. Democrats will stand strong, strong for that standard of balance. 
and will remain resolute, resolute in the pursuit of fairness for all Americans, regardless of where they were born or the color of their skin, regardless of the size of their bank accounts, regardless of their religion or their sexual orientation. Those principles will direct our course as we introduce our first 10 bills today, a tradition we've had in the United States Senate. That is, the majority party introduces the first 10 bills. And as we mend our broken immigration system, strengthen our schools, and rebuild our roads and bridges, we'll look to other measures that are included in those 10 bills. These principles will be foremost in our minds as we balance the right to bear arms with the right of every child to grow up safe from gun violence. Those principles will be our North Star as we work to end wasteful tax loopholes and balance thoughtful spending reductions with revenue from the wealthiest among us. And those principles will point the way as we work to ensure that this country's uniformed service members never struggle to find employment when their military duties end. Through every struggle and every triumph, those principles must be our guide. Not a single piece of important legislation can pass the Senate or become law without the votes of both Democrats and Republicans. So we'll be willing to compromise and work with our colleagues across the aisle. Unfortunately, a number of bipartisan bills passed the Senate during the last Congress. They were never acted upon by the House of Representatives. So this year, the Senate will revisit some of those legislative priorities that passed on a bipartisan basis here. We'll again take up the violence against women. This is an important piece of legislation that has expired. We'll take up the Farm Bill, which was a revolutionary piece of legislation that would save the country up to $24 billion. We would again revisit the historic reforms to save the United States Postal Service and legislation to make whole the victims of Hurricane Sandy. Each of these initiatives passed the Senate on a bipartisan basis after deliberation and debate during the last Congress, but was left to languish by the House. The Senate will continue to help our fellow Americans recover from Hurricane Sandy before another similar disaster strikes. Hundreds of thousands of homes and businesses were destroyed in New York, New Jersey, and New England, and tens of thousands of Americans were left homeless by this destructive storm. We have a responsibility to aid our countrymen as they rebuild their lives and their communities, as we have after terrible floods, fires, and storms in other parts of our nation. Once we complete that vital legislation, the Senate will take action to make this institution that we all love, the United States Senate, work more effectively. We'll consider changes to the Senate, the Senate rules. Because, of this, because this matter warrants additional debate, today we'll follow the precedent set in 2005 and again in 2011. We we'll reserve the right of all senators to propose changes to the Senate rules. And we will explicitly not acquiesce in the carrying over of all the rules from the last Congress. It's my intention that the Senate will recess today rather than adjourn to continue the same legislative day and allow this important rules discussion to continue later this month. I'm hopeful and cautiously optimistic that the Republican leader and I reach an agreement that allows the Senate to operate more effectively in the coming months. The Republican leader. Mr. President, I want to... Uh start by congratulating President Obama on his inauguration. Uh, pres presidential inaugurations are always a time for the country to come together. We all feel a certain pride in the event. And we're reminded, we're reminded of how fortunate we are to live in a nation where we have the ability to choose our leaders freely and resolve our differences in peace. Inauguration Day is also a time for new beginnings a chance to learn from the mistakes and missed opportunities of the past as we re-engage in some vitally important debates about our future. Too often over the past four years, uh, political considerations have trumped the need to put our country on a sound financial footing and a path to prosperity. Today we should recommit ourselves to the task of facing up to the problems head on. I understand that the passions of an election can sometimes overshadow the business of governing, but the presidential campaign is now behind us, and so it's my hope that the president will finally be willing to do what Republicans have been asking him to do since his first inauguration four years ago, and that's to work with us on identifying durable solutions to the problems that we can only solve together. 
to put aside those things we know we can't agree on and focus on what we can agree on. And we should start with spending and debt, because if we don't get a handle on that, nothing else matters. If we don't work together to strengthen our entitlement programs, they will go bankrupt. Automatic cuts will be forced on seniors already receiving benefits, rendering worthless the promises that they've built their retirements around. It's nice to say, as the President did yesterday, that these programs free us to take the risks that make our country great. But if we don't act to strengthen and protect them now, in a few years they simply won't be there in their current form. And if we don't work together to control the debt, then the cost of our interest payments alone will eventually crowd out funding for things we all agree on, from defense to infrastructure and assistance for those who need it most. In short, the debate we're now engaged in over the growing federal debt is about much more than numbers on a page. It's about the cost of inaction in terms of promises broken, jobs lost, and dreams deferred. And that's why there's simply no more time to waste. Over the past four years, while the President focused on re-election and too many Senate Democrats focused on avoiding tough decisions, the debt grew by more than six trillion dollars. We saw the President blast House Republicans for doing their job and passing a budget, while Senate Democrats didn't even propose one. And rather than work with us to save existing entitlements, we saw the President team up with Democrats in Congress to force through a brand new entitlement that will make it even harder to cover the cost of programs that we already have. In short, Democrats have put off the hard stuff until now, and our problems have only gotten worse. But that was the first term. A second term presents the opportunity to do things differently, and in the Senate that means a return to regular order. Later this week, the House plans to send the Senate a bill to address the debt limit in a timely manner. Once we get it, the Senate should quickly respond. If the Senate version is different than the one the House sends over, send it to conference. That's how things are supposed to work around here. We used to call it legislating. I know a lot of Democrats are afraid of a process that exposes their priorities, particularly on spending and debt. After nearly four years of refusing to pass a budget, they've only now reluctantly agreed to develop a spending plan for the coming fiscal year. All I would say to that is that since the revenue question has been settled, I'm sure the American people are eager to see what other ideas Democrats might have to bring down our ruinous, ruinous deficits. And let me just say that one thing Americans will no longer tolerate is an attitude that says we can put off our work until the very last minute. They're tired of 11, 11th hour deals. Tired of 11th hour deals. They're tired of careening from crisis to crisis, and so am I. The good news is a return to regular order is the surest way to solve the problems we face. And I hope some of my friends on the other side will agree that there is value in this body actually functioning the way it was intended to. Let's face it, the status quo isn't working. The Senate isn't functioning as it should. And it has nothing to do with a process that has served us well for a very long time. But if we work together and strive to avoid some of the bad habits that have developed around here, I truly believe that we'll be able to achieve the kinds of solutions that have eluded us for the past four years and deliver some positive results for the people who sent us here with time to spare. We can do better. I know my constituents expect better than what they've been getting from Congress in recent years, and so should we. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Under the previous order, the Senate will be in a period of morning business for debate only until 12.30 p.m., with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each. Mr. President. <clears throat> Senator from Indiana. Uh, Mr. President, I appreciate the remarks of the minority leader here, and I think he essentially gets to the point that all of us who in this first week for the 113th Congress need to be focused on and need to address. Now, this is our first work week back after the inauguration festivities of, of yesterday. 
Um, and it's an appropriate time, I think, for us to discuss the challenges that lay before us, uh, members of this body, over the next two years. Uh, the most pr critical, and in my opinion, the most pressing of these challenges is uh, one that we've been dealing with the past two years and more, uh, but now become of, I think, even more critical importance. And that is the out of control government spending that weakens the health of our economy, it threatens the security of our country, and it jeopardizes opportunities for future generations. When I arrived here two years ago, um, uh, it was clear uh, that the American people uh, were concerned, a growing concern about the out of control of federal spending. Uh, at the beginning of the President's term four years ago, that uh, debt limit stood at ten trillion six hundred and twenty six billion plus dollars. In the four years of uh, uh, that term, uh, it has risen to six, over sixteen trillion four hundred billion dollars, uh, more than a six trillion dollar increase. Uh, it's unprecedented in the history of our country to have such out of control spending. It has resulted in our borrowing a very substantial amount of each year's budget, uh, which is not healthy, whether you're a family or whether you're a business or whether you're a uh, state government or whether you're the federal government. Uh, the chickens come home to roost uh, if we continue to do that. Each American share of our national debt now is over, well over $50,000, and that means every new baby born in this country instantly owes the government more than $51,000. We've had four straight years of trillion dollar deficits uh, without a budget in this body. The, majority, or the minority leader just talked about that. Hopefully we will have finally uh, a budget from which to work off of and a budget for which we can look at what the priorities are and make the tough decisions about how we spend taxpayers' money. We currently spend over $40,000 a second. These are not partisan numbers, and this should not be a partisan issue. These are the facts. As our former governor, Mitch Daniels, said, just do the arithmetic. Uh, this isn't uh, necessarily uh, some deep philosophical or ideological issue here. It's, it's, it's a matter of, of basic math. Uh, with financial problems as great as these, it was my hope that when we return uh, now to this 113th Congress will be able to address this fiscal crisis, the same hope I had two years ago when I joined the 112th. And as we know, um, uh, we went through a series of efforts uh, to begin to address this problem. As many of those were on a bipartisan basis. The Gang of Six, which turned into the Super Committee of Twelve, uh, was a bipartisan effort. Uh, many of us worked with uh, our colleagues across the aisle uh, in trying to put uh, a grand bargain together. Uh, of course, the President had his own commission, uh, led by uh, Mr. Bowles and the former Senator Simpson. Uh, that was rejected. Um, that would have been a, a good blueprint um, upon which to uh, begin our discussions. Uh, I'll be talking some more about that, the, the, the disappointment, the extreme disappointment of Mr. Bowles and Mr. Simpson uh, in terms of the inability of this body. Uh, to address uh, what has been predicted as the most predictable financial crisis in our nation's history. Now, uh, we went through this whole process of the fiscal cliff. Uh, we unfortunately had to pick the lesser of two evils in order to protect nearly 99 percent of taxpayers from drastic tax increases, starting with the lowest to the highest taxpayer. Uh, the fiscal cliff deal may have allowed the president to fulfill his campaign promise to raise taxes on millionaires and billionaires, but it did little or nothing to address excessive federal spending. So the debate now shifts. So the president got his taxes uh, with revenue off the table. The de debate shifts to where it needs to be and should have been in the first place, and that is addressing spending reductions. Just last week, Fitch Ratings warned that America's AAA credit rating is at risk if the Congress and the President increase the debt limit but fail to enact a credible medium-term deficit reduction plan. And we can expect to see more headlines like this 
If we do not come together and we do not take action to deal with our country's debt obligations. In the coming days and weeks, uh, I'll be speaking in this chamber and outlining what I believe are rational steps that we need to take to get our fiscal house in order. The easy thing to do, and the way Congress has operated over these past two years of my service here, is to look at our fiscal situation and say, well, we have more time. Or we can deal with this after the next election. And while I thought that was exactly the wrong tact tactic to take, that's at what happened. And there was a series of efforts. Uh, each one ended up so-called kicking the can down the road or postponing the day of decision. This is the day of decision. This is the hour of decision. This is the time when we have to step up now and address our out-of-control spending. We've had that next election. The president has been re-elected for four years. Members here have been re-elected. We have this challenge now in front of us. But continuing with the status quo, governing via crisis, and failing to address our spending problem must be unacceptable. 2013 is the year. 2014, we're back in another election. We all know that the precious six to nine to 12 months that lay before us is the time post-election with a new pres president re-election and new members here. This is the time we have to step up and address our debt and deficit problem. If we don't do so now, most experts who look at this, and I'm not an economist, but most economists, whether they're liberal or conservative, whether they are nonpartisan or partisan, whether they are ideological or non-ideological, have virtually all come to the conclusion that unless we address this now in 2013, with an election year in 2014, 2015 will be too late. We have seen what's happening in Europe. We, are see, we see what's happening in Japan. We see what's happening around the world. A world hungry for America to lead, to address its problem, not through pushing it down the road, not through uh, uh, avoiding tough decisions, but addressing the real issue before us that uh, uh, impacts on the future of this country and the future of generations to come. So now is the time, now is the hour of decision that we have to take to go forward and address this problem. And as I said, I will be using this platform and others as a way to address what I believe we need to go forward with, not only looking at the larger picture, but also looking at how this government spends way beyond its means, spends money that it doesn't have, uh, wastes money through bureaucracy and, and waste and failed efforts, tries to do more than it should or could or is able. And I want to document some of those. Everything from the macro to the micro, to the absurd, to the bureaucratic, uh, to the necessary tough decisions, particularly in regard to our entitlements, uh, that have to be addressed in order to preserve and save those programs for not only current beneficiaries, but for future beneficiaries. Mr. President, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to begin this process. And I think each of us must dedicate ourselves to the, the challenge that lies before us, and that challenge is dealing with our out-of-control fiscal situation that, if not controlled, will bring this country down and continue this economic malaise that we're currently in. With that, Mr. President, I yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Thank you. A quorum call on the floor of the Senate this morning. They came in at 10 o'clock as uh, senators have been offering general speeches this morning. Negotiations continuing behind the scenes now as uh, Senate negotiators hammer out changes to Senate rules. While this quorum call continues, we'll go live now to the Washington National Cathedral where this morning President Obama, Vice President Biden and their spouses are attending the national prayer service. Again, live coverage from the Washington National Cathedral. It's getting underway shortly.
Buenos días. Buenos días. Mi nombre es Marianne Edgar Bade y soy la obispo, obispo Episcopal en la diócesis de Washington. I'm Gary Hall. I'm the dean of Washington National Cathedral. Es nuestro gran privilegio de extender una bienvenida a esta casa de oración para todos los pueblos. It is our great pleasure to extend a warm and big welcome to uh, everyone to this house of prayer for all people. Aunque nuestras idiomas y tradiciones de fe sean distintas, de nosotros Dios nos está formando a un pueblo unido en nuestro deseo para la paz y el bienestar de todos. Although we have distinct faith traditions and we speak different languages, we are united in our shared desire for peace and for goodwill for the entire human community. Están en su casa. Welcome to your house. God be merciful unto us and bless us. That your ways may be known upon earth. Let the people praise you, O God. Blessed be the one holy and living God. Look graciously, mighty God, upon this land. Where it is in pride, subdue it. Where it is in need, supply it. Where it is in error, rectify it. Where it is in default, restore it. And where it holds to that which is just and compassionate, toward the poor and vulnerable of every race and background in our nation, support it. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Seek the Lord who wills to be found. Call upon the Lord who draws near. 
Let the wicked forsake their ways and the evil ones their thoughts. And let them turn to the Lord who will have compassion and to our God who will richly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as rain and snow fall from the heavens and return not again, but water the earth, bringing forth life and giving growth, seed for sowing and bread for eating, so is my word that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish that which I have purposed and prosper in that for which I sent it. The word of the Lord. Hanun Adonai Vitzadik. Ve'elohenu merachem. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. The Lord watches over and calls upon us to watch over the innocent. Turn again to your rest, nafshi, my soul. For the Lord has treated you well. For you have rescued my life from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from stumbling. I will walk in the presence of the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, even when I said I have been brought so low. How shall I repay the Lord for all the good that he has done for me? I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all God's people.
Faithful God, accept the fervent prayers of all your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls. Let us pray for those charged with the governance of our nation. Strengthen the hearts of our President Barack and our Vice President Joseph. Make them bold for the work you have set before them. Grant them wisdom to discern your will and to consider your word among the counsel they receive. Uphold them that they may discharge their duties in the full light of your divine grace. Keep this nation under your care. Give courage to the senators and members of the House of Representatives to hear the people's voice and to provide for the common good. Give them the vision to care for your creation. Lead them to willingly fulfill our obligations and responsibilities in the community of nations. Keep this nation in your care. Stir up the passion and reverence of the justices of the Supreme Court for the rule of law and the way of justice. Fill their deliberations with insight and their judgments with integrity as they act to secure human rights and the flourishing of responsible freedom. Keep this nation under your care. Guide, we beseech you. 
Allah or Lord, all those to whom we commit the government of this nation. Give them the discernment and the self-control necessary to our time. May they consider all questions calmly, negotiate sincerely, and act wisely and promptly in all things. Give them the desire to uphold the right, abhorring the wrong, and performing that which is just, so that in all things your will may be done. Let us pray to the Lord. A reading from St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. It is God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. The word of the Lord.
I will make it. I will make it. Determined. Determined. I can take it. I can take it.
أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة Love.